If you've been following the news coming out of the U.S. recently, you might be scared for the lives of trans people, pregnant people, and children. Their worlds are becoming more and more restricted. Their freedoms, meager as they always were, are evaporating. Laws are popping up criminalizing abortion, gender transition, and drag, while strengthening the police state to enforce these laws. Some people have downplayed the importance of such legislation by calling it culture war distraction from bigger issues. However, to the right wing, these bills are not intended to distract. Their purpose is to reinforce the system of patriarchy. They're reasserting the power of the patriarchal state over the bodies of its subjects. I've talked elsewhere about the importance of consent, but states and people who want to bend you to their will don't care about consent. In fact, they're violently opposed to it. We live in an age where gender equality seems to be on the horizon, where trans and non-binary people are causing us to reconsider how gender works, and where it's normal to expect consent because your body is your own. All these changes have come at the expense of the powerful. They've spent centuries establishing their ownership over your body. And that's the story we're telling today. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel that auto-played after you ran out of better quality videos to watch. Before we go too far, let's have a word from today's sponsors. Adam and Steve. Adam and Steve, the gay Christian underwear store. Because it's Adam and Eve, but it should be Adam and Steve, too. Available in the It Had To Be Said merch store. In my last two videos, I've tried to explain how so much of the world got stolen from us. Humans used to just work for themselves and each other. Now, they have to work for whoever has money. We used to have some independence in the form of land and resources, but they all got privatized. You can see how much has been taken if you take stock. Not just our labor or money, but our time, our sense of security, our health and energy. They belong to the people with all the money, like a kind of debt you can never repay. In this video, I'm going to weave history with the present as I explain why the ruling class has so much power over your body and its functions. Because as the book we're reading today, Caliban and the Witch, will teach you, a lot of the problems we're dealing with today originated in Europe during the early days of capitalism. The state had always claimed some control of the body through forced labor under the threat of violence, but the extent of its control expanded dramatically. Did you know your body belonged to the state? If you disagree, perhaps you could explain where these laws came from. As of this recording, abortion has been banned in 13 U.S. states. People who got pregnant in the U.S briefly, couple generations, had the freedom to decide what happened with their own bodies. Then it was all snatched away. A few pieces of legislation here and there and suddenly people find themselves forced to have a child they don't want. Next. This is a recent post from Aaron Reed who tracks some of this legislation, especially the hundreds of anti-trans bills in state legislatures. These laws would force parents and teachers to out trans youth, ban affirming their gender, ban acknowledging the existence of gender nonconforming people, ban trans health care, ban them from bathrooms when children are present. Shit, they ban cis people from dressing up. So from now on, you have to dress the way the police and the judges approve of. You might have heard they're banning trans people from sports, but did you know in Florida, Ohio, and Kansas, they're actually authorizing inspecting children's genitals to tell them what teams they have to be on? Yes, they're doing that. Yes, you're right to be disgusted. The bills are basically legalized bigotry. 
Speaking of bigotry, as you probably know, relations between black and white people were illegal in parts of the slave-owning U.S., and were so until just a few generations ago. Now, the right wing is using the trans panic it concocted to bring back anti-race mixing policies. Tennessee has made it legal for government workers to refuse to legalize a marriage between queer interfaith or interracial couples. That's because the trans panic is a wedge the right wing can use to take power and destroy every last freedom you thought you had. For all their talk of the horrors of mutilating children when they mean legal adults choosing to undergo medical procedures, the right wing is just fine with cutting up the genitals of actual children if the father wants them circumcised. What's more, all these bills criminalizing gender transition, you know, not just surgery, but even socially transitioning, all have exceptions for intersex children. If children are intersex, apparently, it's just fine to continue to mutilate them. People who encourage the criminalization of pregnant or trans people's bodies can't be said to care about freedom or consent, but only control over others, especially their own wives and kids. Of course, they say, Won't somebody please think of the children? But what they mean is ban things we don't like and say it's to protect kids. Meanwhile, children are simply not taught to consent to people touching them, or for that matter, telling them lies, gutting their libraries, deciding their gender and sexuality for them, or deciding their careers for them. It's not about protecting anyone, it's about control. Every modern state retains the power to regulate your body. Just because things like abortion might be legal at present where you live doesn't mean it can't change with a new government. And it might, because these Christians are spreading this patriarchal capitalist authoritarianism beyond the borders of the United States. Last time I talked about how the enclosure of land in Britain destroyed the commons and laid the groundwork for capitalism. That's where we left off. I didn't talk much about the intense violence the ruling class would inflict to control the body, especially women's bodies, during this time. To overcome resistance, capitalism required a disunited working class and a subservient female caste. Women's power had to be destroyed. Their very bodies broken and controlled for capitalism to emerge. The commons had been especially important for women as the center of social life, the place where they convened, exchanged news, took advice, and where a woman's viewpoint on communal events, autonomous from that of men, could form. They stood up to men and the church who tried to enforce patriarchal norms, often leading movements against feudalism. But the theft of the commons destroyed community, as workers no longer worked together but left town to look for work elsewhere. But it did so much more, as the new alliance of capitalists with the landed gentry would wage a campaign of violence that would transform gender relations. In order to reverse the gender solidarity achieved in the anti-feudal struggle, rape was pretty much decriminalized. Feudal European authorities in the 14th century co-opted young male workers by encouraging them to rape working-class women. This cruelty created a climate of intense misogyny that degraded all women regardless of class. It also desensitized the population to the perpetration of violence against women, preparing the ground for the witch hunt the first of which took place at the end of the 14th century. This legal tradition of blaming or just not giving a shit about the victims of rape continues to this day. Most victims don't get any kind of justice out of the system, even if we assume justice just means punishing perpetrators. If you get pregnant as a result of rape, in many places you're not allowed to terminate the pregnancy. 
and in a few states, a rapist can sue his victim for custody of the child. Then survivors try to tell their stories and millions of people mock and threaten them because they want to keep alive the norm that they can do whatever they want to keep their power over other people's bodies unchecked. A major aspect of original expropriation that I didn't go into much in the last video was turning the body into a machine for work. To accomplish that, capitalists needed to break the power of the workers, especially women. In Europe and the Americas, women's power was crushed by persecuting witches. Primitive accumulation, or original expropriation as I'm calling it then, wasn't simply an accumulation and concentration of exploitable workers and capital. It was also an accumulation of differences and divisions within the working class, whereby hierarchies built upon gender as well as race and age became constitutive of class rule and the formation of the modern proletariat or working class. The outcome was a peasantry polarized not only by the deepening economic inequalities but by a web of hatred and resentments that's well documented in the records of the witch hunt, which show that quarrels relating to requests for help, the trespassing of animals, or unpaid rents were in the background of many accusations. The majority of those accused were poor peasant women, while those who accused them were wealthy and prestigious members of the community, often their employers or landlords, that is, individuals who were part of the local power structures and often had close ties with the central state. So why don't we talk more about the witch hunts and their impact on history? Even Marxist historians have consigned the witch hunt to oblivion, as if it were irrelevant to the history of the class struggle. Yet the dimensions of the massacre should have raised some suspicions, as hundreds of thousands of women were burned, hanged, and tortured in less than two centuries. It should also have seemed significant that the witch hunt occurred simultaneously with the colonization and extermination of the populations of the New World, the English enclosures, the beginning of the slave trade, the enactment of bloody laws against vagabonds and beggars, and it climaxed in that interregnum between the end of feudalism and the capitalist takeoff, when the peasantry in Europe reached the peak of its power but in time also consummated its historic defeat. So far, however, this aspect of primitive accumulation has truly remained a secret. The unleashing of a campaign of terror against women unmatched by any other persecution weakened the resistance of the European peasantry to the assault launched against it by the gentry in the state, at a time when the peasant community was already disintegrating under the combined impact of land privatization, increased taxation, and the extension of state control over every aspect of social life. The witch hunt deepened the divisions between women and men teaching men to fear the power of women, and destroyed a universe of practices, beliefs, and social subjects whose existence was incompatible with the capitalist work discipline. There's lots more to read, hang on. Witch hunting in Europe was an attack on women's resistance to the spread of capitalist relations and the power that women had gained by virtue of their sexuality, their control over reproduction, and their ability to heal. Witch hunting was also instrumental to the construction of a new patriarchal order where women's bodies, their labor, their sexual and reproductive powers were placed under the control of the state and transformed into economic resources. This means that the witch hunters were less interested in the punishment of any specific transgressions than in the elimination of generalized forms of female behavior, which they no longer tolerated and had to be made abominable in the eyes of the population. All these crimes were not socially recognized crimes, but previously accepted practices and groups that had had to be eradicated from the community through terror and criminalization. In this sense, the charge of witchcraft performed a similar function to that performed by high treason, which significantly was introduced into the English legal code in the same years, and the charge of terrorism in our times. Demonizing women, or just women who don't conform to the dominant order, is still going on. 
we still divide women into the good ones who do what everyone else expects of them, and the bad ones who think for themselves and tell it like it is, like everyone who said hashtag me too. And of course these rigid gender roles place all trans and non-binary people in the bad category, whatever their gender. Not only did the witch hunt sanctify male supremacy, it also instigated men to fear women, and even to look at them as the destroyers of the male sex. Remember last video when intellectuals had all the arguments why the poor needed to be worked to exhaustion every day forever? Well, they did the same for why women needed to be subjugated. This tradition lives on in the form of the misogynistic streak that runs through the streamer podcast debate bro community. Shit, this is Stefan Molyneux to a T, right down to using facts and logic to justify women's subjugation and his creepy obsession with their reproduction. Just as today, by repressing women, the ruling class has more effectively repressed the entire proletariat. They instigated men who'd been expropriated, pauperized, and criminalized to blame their personal misfortunes on the castrating witch, and to view the power that women had won against the authorities as a power women would use against them. You know, because feminism is destroying motherhood, boys, values, the West, and, you know, everything. The powers that be demonized and banned female sexuality so they could control it too. Sex was supposed to be for procreation only. You may have noticed the modern right wing is obsessed with sex, who's having it, who they're having it with, how they're having it, and even whether they're having it. So-called sodomy, a stand-in for homosexual relations, was illegal in 14 U.S. states until 2003, when the Supreme Court struck them down. Creeps like Matt Walsh even go after asexual people, because apparently not having sex is a problem for them, too. They want to force strict gender roles on everyone and decide the correct way and amount of sex for you. This is what they're protecting you from. But for all their accusations of groomer, they don't seem to mind child marriage. Most states allow marriage at 16, and 13 states have no minimum marriage age. The vast majority of these marriages are between a girl and a full-grown man. In some states, minors can't legally separate or divorce. Because men had lost so much from enclosure, women were offered up to them as broodmares. As bad as feudalism was, at least women had some amount of power in relation to men because of their access to the commons and their ability to organize with each other. Under early capitalism, women's labor, including sexual and reproductive labor, became the new commons, available to anyone. Think how long it's taken for women to claw their way back to the point where you're actually supposed to give consent first, and how many men continue to reject their autonomy. Women were kept out of many industries, and when they were included, earned way less than men did. They experienced poverty, dependence, and violence. Women's roles were gradually reduced to that of unpaid child bearers and housekeepers, almost completely dependent on men. They were kept out of view and weren't even supposed to talk with their female friends. They were invisible. Everything had been stolen from them. By the beginning of the 17th century, once women had been defeated by two centuries of witch hunts, there emerged a new model of womanhood. Passive, obedient, thrifty, of few words, always busy at work, and chaste. So when people talk about traditional gender roles, they mean the roles 
imposed a few hundred years ago to create a pliant workforce, when women and girls were forced to stay at home, obey their husbands, and work for no pay in the service of everyone's capitalist masters. And hey, if that's your kink, who am I to shame you? But you should probably know where it comes from. Even when women are apparently in charge of the household, it's just because they've assumed the role that was once reserved for men. They're not changing the way things are done in a way that might encourage children's autonomy, but just letting oppressive parenting customs evolve with the time. The right to use violence against one's children to sort out their behavior is the same as the right of the man to use violence against his wife to correct her behavior. It's a power one group claims and wields over a subordinate group, just like the power the state claims and wields over the people. And it's hardly a coincidence. People with power create additional hierarchies in society, not just in the state, but in every aspect of life. The state mostly punishes adults. In effect, the state and the ruling class, whoever, together, whatever, delegates to parents the power to police their children. That's why patriarchy isn't something that's just done by men. It's done by anybody. We've all been taught these oppressive attitudes and behaviors, and fortunately, we can also unlearn them. Due to a demographic crisis, the state began to regulate every aspect of women's bodies, which it has never relinquished. The family was made centrally important, birth control and abortions became capital crimes, and spies conducted surveillance on unwed mothers. Those women who tried to administer contraceptives were often burned as witches. When the European empires brought colonial rule to indigenous people, they called them witches too, or cannibals, or devil worshippers, or whatever it took to justify violence against them. Doctors took over from midwives, and medical practice began to prioritize the life of the fetus over that of the person giving birth which is basically the philosophy of today's anti-abortion crowd. More women were persecuted for witchcraft in the 16th and 17th centuries than for any other crime except, significantly, infanticide. Because your baby belongs to the state. But if it dies as a result of state-induced poverty, it's still your fault. In sum, women became the unpaid servants of men to produce children to work in factories. Can you see the parallels with today in the US? The recriminalization of abortion and maybe contraceptives, the police state set up to enforce it at the same time as the reintroduction of child labor. Because women just can't be trusted with their own bodies. Politicians should make those decisions for you. See how much gets stolen from you before you're even born? It's your body, your sensations, your mind. Because if other people can guilt and punish you for what you do with your own body, they control your body. At this time, of course, it was even worse for enslaved women whose bodies were considered men's property and whose kids were ripped from their arms and sold in front of their eyes. Both of these types of control of women's bodies created the labor force. This practice of kidnapping children was repeated by colonial states to force indigenous children into schools that stripped them of their culture and subjected them to such cruelties were still discovering their graves. The state retains this power today. Black and indigenous people especially still have their children taken from them, usually for minor infractions. Like all powers the state claims over you, if you allow something to happen to some people today, it will get done to you tomorrow. Florida has recently passed laws stating you can have your child taken away from you if they say they're transgender. 
Just having a trans child makes you a criminal and throws your child into the adoption system, where they'll get tortured by conversion therapy until they're old enough to confine to prison for more torture. And this law doesn't necessarily change standard practice in these states. How do they get away with passing laws like this? Because legally, your body and your children belong to the state. These budding empires spread the belief that women and children were the property of men. They imposed new sexual hierarchies on native people around the world, the rule of the husband. French Jesuits not only instructed the Montagnier and Nascapi to dominate their wives, but to beat their children, believing their excessive fondness for their offspring was the major obstacle to their Christianization. Thanks to imperialism, these oppressive ideas have spread all over the world. Most child abuse comes from parents or guardians, and that's because Parental control is absolute. It's the same reason guards abuse people in prison. They have total control, backed by an ideology saying they should have control and should use violence to enforce compliance. So when you hear about parents' rights, remember they mean as opposed to children's rights. Between the sweatshops of Europe and the plantations in the Americas and Africa was formed the International Division of Labor. In other words, the reason resources were and still are grown and mined in what was then called the Third World, then shipped to Europe, or now also Asia, for processing. The world today still lives with the brutality visited on black and brown people the world over in the past several hundred years. Slavery isn't over, even in the US, where prisoners are farmed out to corporations to make goods for their global supply chains. By no coincidence, the same color people who were enslaved and colonized are disproportionately targeted for prison. So since the early days of capitalism, we've been taught to treat women and children as our property. We've learned not to care about their consent. We've learned to accept the state's power to regulate our bodies and kidnap our children. But we can resist. We should steal back what's been stolen from us. The commons, our minds, our bodies, and our freedom. 